Hello world, it's Virtual Prey 5 Cutpla, and welcome to my review of Star Trek Picard, Season 2, Episode 8, Mercy. As in, what you'll be asking for once you finish watching this episode. And to be completely honest, yesterday, I had to have a tooth extracted. A very large, long tooth as my dentist explained. And it took over two hours to extract this tooth. Two hours of several dentists trying their best, running around me, cursing in a language I did not understand, back and forth to each other. I could tell things were not going wrong, uh, going right as I only had local anesthesia, I was wide awake and I could smell the horrible smells, hear and feel the cracking of tooth and bone and God knows what kind of saws and drills and terrible tasting liquids they were spraying in my mouth, but God bless them. There was no pain. That was the mercy I had yesterday. So as I was down, uh, you know, looking up at all this stuff going on, the constant x-rays, the constant stream of uh, anesthesia, I was debating whether what I was going through at that moment was worse than what I had gone through earlier in the day when I watched season eight of Picard. You know what? I'm not sure. It was close. It was close. So episode eight, Mercy, starts out with a, uh, a, uh, a flashback to Vulcans landing on Earth and it turns out that our uh, X Files guy, Agent Weller, I thought he was I thought he was LAPD. Turns out he's FBI. Uh, his name is Weller, but he's basically Fox Mulder from the FBI uh, X Files. And um, it turns out, as a kid, he had a first contact with Vulcans. Now, why are there Vulcans on Earth? Well, we knew from Star Trek Enterprise, Carbon Creek, one of my favorite Enterprise episodes, that the Vulcans had been visiting Earth for God knows how many years, uh, and uh, but they just didn't make contact, official first contact, until 2063, Zephyrin Cochran, Warp Barrier, all that stuff. But uh, as we saw in Carbon Creek, they made unofficial contact, you know, several times, I guess. Uh, they were putting some routine equipment down. This poor kid was running around the forest at night looking for his dog because that's a thing that happened, or at least it used to happen in the 80s, I guess. Um, anyway, so he had an encounter with a Vulcan who uh, made a big impact on him. And so ever since then, he's been trying to prove aliens exist. And now he found Picard and Guinan. So he's, he's going to make it his life's mission. I mean, he, here he is, proof in his hands that they're aliens. And, you know, this is, he's finally his chance to shine. He's, he's locked them in the basement of the field office. Guinan has enough sense to sense that hey, this isn't this isn't a real operation. We're in the basement with broken filing cabinets. What are you trying to do here? And he's like, "You're right. You are in a basement. This is where things go to disappear." And he's like, "I already told my superiors. Uh, you you guys are done for. So tell me what's going on." And you can see some actual fear for reasons yet unknown 
for in Picard and Guinan's eyes. Uh, and I suppose if they believed him, you know, maybe it would be time to fear. But uh, it seems that they don't mind telling everybody and their parents that they're all aliens. They're, they're yelling it from the rooftops. Hey, we're from the future. We're, we're not all from Earth. Uh, so why do they care at this point? Why do they care? I don't know. But, uh, man, this to, to talk about a series that says, okay, now don't tell anybody where from the future. You know, respect the prime directive, the temporal prime directive. And then to just every fucking person they find, hey, by the way, I'm from the future and she's an alien and she's a Borg queen. Oh, and we have a spaceship. It's parked, not even cloaked. There's uh, cops investigating the house unless they just gave up because that's what the French police do. I guess you call them saying somebody's being attacked and they send one cop and then never come back to see what happened to the cop. Okay, so Rios is on his ship. He took the doctor and her kid to his ship at the end of last episode, basically to, to I, I wish I could figure out any other reason, but the only reason I could think of taking the doctor and her kid back to his ship is that he was hoping to get lucky. There is no other logical reason to do so. So Rio, anyway, Rafi and Seven are telling Rios to stay in the ship, uh, that he's got to fix the ship. He's got to find out what the Borg Queen did to the ship. And, uh, oh, Rios says, by the way, we've got big problems. The transporter's not working. The Borg Queen fucked up the transporter before she left, who is, in fact, uh, Gerardi. Gerardi effed up the transporter. Anyway, Seven and Rafi have tracked down the bar where Gerardi was at hours earlier, in the middle of the night, the bar was busy, and she she broke the, a window. It had to be four, five, six hours ago at night. It's now morning. The bartender is still there cleaning the broken window. So, fine. Anyway, Seven comes up and happens to see the bartender who happened to be watching Gerardi. And she's like, I need help. She's like, I, he's like, I don't talk to cops. He's, she's like, I'm not a cop. I'm her sister. And you can tell she's crazy. I'm trying to put her into, uh, uh, you know, a, a place that she'll be good. And he's like, oh, okay. He realized that she has the same problem I do, or she knows somebody who's crazy. He knows someone who's crazy. So he immediately tells Seven, oh, I saw her leave with a guy with a red beard, and th she went that way. And Seven's like, oh, thank you, thank you. And Seven and Rafi take off to follow this path that the bartender happened to see hours ago. So of course you know it will lead directly to Gerardi. Okay, so now we're back in the FBI field office and Ju uh, Julian. Guinan, not Guinan, fake Guinan, the woman who is absolutely not Whoopi Goldberg pretending to be Guinan, is talking to the field agent, trying to do a, a, um, a reading on him. She's good, she's a bartender, and he doesn't care. He looks at Picard's hand, and says, that's a pretty big bruise. And uh, Picard says, oh, I was dehydrated. I'm the only human after all, which he's not. Picard honestly said he's human and he's from Earth. He might be from Earth, though he's really not. He's really not. His body was not built on Earth and his body is no longer human. So Picard lied twice. And he didn't think he was lying. That's the problem. Picard honestly thinks he was human 
and he was on earth, from earth. His last body was human, and his last body was from earth, but not this one. And the writers just forgot. The writers, and they expected us to forget. So now we're back in uh, Dr. Soong's place with Corey, the daughter, who looks like Soji. And Corey uh, apparently has access to a 2D to 3D VR system that allows her to access her father's lab. And she puts on these VR goggles. And Q has embedded himself in the VR goggles as a quote-unquote living program he put in there when he hacked the father's network. So he was waiting just for Corey to put on the glasses, and Q is telling her that he has the answer she seeks. And on top of that, he has the cure. So if she wants the cure, and it's got a tag on it called freedom, so she can take the blue medicine and she'll be free of, of the fact that she's a, an experiment that's been controlled by Dr. Soong this entire time. She's like, this, this looks like a human genome. Am I, am I an experiment? Yes, you are, you schmuck. You, he says he created you and he locked you in a prison and Q is going to give him, give her the key. Anyway, she's finding this very hard to, to figure out, but everything she's trying should be an inner monologue. She talks it out loud. For what reason? Exposition, the audience's benefit, but it is so sickening. Nothing about this is natural. Everything she says, it feels like she should be talking to someone else. There needs to be someone else in the scene. She has zero reason to say any of this stuff out loud. So there she gets, she happens to get a delivery immediately as soon as the VR program runs. And so she has the real, the real cure for her disease. And it says freedom on it. And with a little bow. So the Gerardi, not Gerardi, Rafi and Seven are following the uh, directions the bartender says they get to a, a they get to a parking lot and there's a dead man with the red beard a dead white man with the beard next to a dumpster and they're just talking over him nobody nobody even touched him to see if he had any any pulse they just assume he's dead and they're like oh Gerardi must have killed him and so they walk away. There's a just, it's just a dead white man. Nobody gives a shit. Don't even look at him too close. Don't wait. Don't go for a pulse. And they're just talking over him casually. It's the broad, it's broad daylight in Los Angeles. Two women just talking over the body of a dead white man. And nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares. There's traffic. There's, there's people walking around. Nobody cares. There's a dead man here. Dead man. Who gives a shit? Rafi and Seven are talking about their fucking relationship over the body of this poor schmuck. Who, God forbid, he fell for Gerardi, who is still walking around in her torn red dress. That was his only crime, having a dick and falling for Gerardi. This scene is still going. He is still dead. Nobody touched him. No, can we save him? No, what repercussions does this have on our future timeline? Maybe this guy was the next Hitler. Maybe he kills the next Hitler. Who the fuck cares? Just a dead guy here. We can keep talking about how, what did we think our future was going to be? Oh, I'm manipulative. And Rafi admits she was a manipulative bitch. But so the fuck why? Oh, I hear a noise. Oh, what's that? Well, it's obviously Gerardi in another parking lot. And she is only 
taking out the batteries of a dozen cars. So what? how did they catch up to being two minutes behind her from being her having a six-hour head start? Girardi runs across a bunch of cars, kicks seven to the other side of the parking lot, and then holds Girardi up by the neck. And in one hand, uh, Rafi holds Rafi up by one hand. Uh, she could clearly kill Rafi. I, I'm kind of actually rooting for Girardi to kill Rafi because I hate Rafi. She's an asshole and she's only going to get worse. Nothing in this episode makes you feel any better about Rafi. Anyway, Girardi just lets Rafi go because, you know, female empowerment. So she kicks seven, lets Rafi go, and walks off. She had the power to kill the random white dude, but she won't she won't kill her friends. I don't I don't know. So now we're back in the FBI basement and uh, the agent Wells comes back. He says obsession is only obsession till it pays off. And he's like he's like I had clues. Clearly you wouldn't go to a hospital. You had to have gone to a clinic. So then he's like, where did I hear a clinic before? And he found a picture of, of uh, Rios. He's like, this guy Rios, he was at a clinic. He was arrested at a clinic by ICE. And he's like, this is the confession he gave to ICE. He's like, why don't you read this out loud? And he says he was stuck in a primitive past in a, a timeline with a ragtag group of misfits. And he's got a a cybernetic queen who we think is in it to wipe out humanity and his cohort, a crusty old admiral who, if I understand correctly, is now a flesh and blood robot. So, so Picard is saying clearly he's being subjected to barbaric inter interrogation techniques. He's like wiping out humanity. Maybe we should circle back to that. He just had the clinic searched. Oh, shit. And there's, there's Rios's comm badge that the kid left. And Rios, Rios mis misplaced four episodes ago his, his comm badge. And so now they're going to separate Guinan and Picard so that he's going to do the interrogation uh, of Picard alone. Now we head back to the, the spaceship, which is no longer cloaked for reasons unknown as the daylight comes up in France. I don't know where this world is that the daylight hasn't yet come in France or is only coming up now when it's now morning in LA, but whatever, whatever. Um, it's not cloaked, just not cloaked. So is it at least what, two days? have gone on in, uh, in, in France. The police haven't been back. Uh, there's a spaceship just in the, in the bushes. Uh, anyway, he tells the kid, oh, you can order any food you want from the replicator. Any food you want. So the kid's like, I want four cakes. And of course, four cakes get replicated. You know, single serving cakes, but whatever. Four of them. And of course, the mother allows the kid to take this food from a replicator that God knows what the Borg Queen programmed it to do. Maybe those are nanite cakes. I bet the kid is going to become the first Borg King. No, it's not going to happen. But of course, he just eats four cakes and gets a stomach ache. But now the mother lets the kid run away with four cakes. The mother now and... Rios have a conversation. I couldn't make this up if I tried. This conversation is so cringe. They needed to put it in multiple languages because the laws of physics would not allow the cringe to exist in solely one language. So we're going back and forth between Spanish and I assume Spanish and, and English. And she's like, let's say we were married for 10 years and a business partner 
uh, I don't know, you had a business partner and we, we were stuck and we were going to drive to the family for Christmas and we're stuck in a shitty motel. We go to the bar and hang out. Meanwhile, they've got kids. They put the kids to sleep. And oh, and she's been thinking of having an affair with a friend from work. And she's like, so tell me, what would we talk about if we had been married for 10 years and I was thinking of having an affair on you? And it's Christmas and we have kids. And I, I honestly, this is the, this is the, this is the dialogue. And I don't know what the fuck I'm listening to. Who, who talks like this? So she's just jumping to let's fuck it. Let's have, let's pretend we were married. Let's pretend we've been married 10 years. Let's pretend it was a shitty marriage. Let's pretend that you're about to lose me. Tell me something now that would prevent me from walking away from you in 10 fucking years. In Espanol y Inglés. No hablo Espanol, por favor. Fuck. Every fucking time I got to read the, 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 the closed captioning to say, see what the fuck they're talking about. And anyway, Rio says something. I don't know because I wasn't looking at the screen. And she runs back and kisses him. So I guess it worked. Back at the FBI office, uh, Mulder is trying to find out from Picard what what was he trying to do? What why was he trying to destroy the Europa mission? And Picard is like, I'm not trying to stop the Europa mission. And uh, Agent Wells, he's like, Listen, I'm smart. Your alien tech is way beyond Earth. Okay, he's like, you 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 can speak our language. You made it to our planet. Clearly, your eons beyond us. He's like, but understand. Uh, you're here now, you've got pain receptors, and the people I know are coming, they're going to, they're going to cut you open, they're going to see how you work, you're not going to get a better deal than you will from me. And he's like, I've already put in the work, they know you're here, and they're on their way, so you better just start talking. So Guinan, who is conveniently alone, gets uh somebody comes in her office in her in her whatever room and it's q wearing an fbi an fbi shirt and she's like you're q you're late why are you so late and and she's like the summoning didn't work and q is like summoning the summoning is a sacred ritual not not a way to just chat with me blah 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 so now guinan realizes q is dying She's like, I felt something, emptiness, fear. She's like, ah, it wasn't from me. It was you. Why are you? She's like, are you dying? You're not supposed to be able to die. And Q, and Q admits it. She ad he admits it. He's like, for the first time, when I'm looking at the timeline or the, the, the time continuity, whatever, for the first time, as he looks, oh, the temporal horizon. The first time he looks at the temporal horizon, he sees darkness for the first time. He's on the threshold of the unknowable. He thought this was good. In fact, we saw the queue in Voyager. The continuum was stale. It was old. People there were just waiting to die, and though they couldn't die until they could, uh, it was it was good. Q was happy. Something new was happening. It was a change. But then, and what I'm sure that this has been put in there by, you know, militant atheist Patrick Stewart, that Q is seeing that he's not going to another form of existence. He's just going to nothing. He's walk. He, he's there's nothing else for him. He's just leaving. He's falling apart. 
There's nothing coming. He's trying to vaporize Guinan, but he's got no more. He has no more spark. He's got no more. Uh, he can't crack his fingers, uh, snap his fingers anymore. It's gone. So he's trying to redeem his life in a single act. Anyway, Guinan's like, why did you bring him here? Why did you bring him to the past? He was like, it wasn't me who brought him to the past. He brought himself to the past. So Guinan is saying, but why are you, he's trapped here? And Q is like, it doesn't matter he's trapped. It's, it's not, it's not, it's the escape that matters, not the trap. And it, it doesn't make any sense. He's arguing these words, these, this, this is what they do. They write this nonsensical dialogue, then pat themselves on the back like they're geniuses. So Dr. Soon comes into his house or at the Soon residence in LA and Corey's up and he's like, ah, shit, I got some explaining to do. And Corey's like, La anyway, Soon is like last night, Corey's looking at a, at a photo of, uh, Corey's looking at a photo of her and, and Dr. Soon as a child or maybe one of her sisters. And now she's like, I was never leaving this house, was I? Yeah, it's like like Persephone, Prosperina, you know, Poltagista, or whatever the fuck. All these names. She's like, different names for the same girl. Daughter of Zeus, father of the gods, my creator. So she's like, you, you know, she's like, explain your experiment to me. Dr. Soon, what, like you didn't know he was a doctor? You knew he was a doctor. The way you say Dr. Soon. You knew he was a doctor the entire fucking time. So he's like, yeah, you were made with nuclear whatever. You gestated. You did this. You did that. He's like, how many were made before me? He's like, I don't know. I stopped counting. The first dozen only lasted a few hours. The next few, a few days, uh, another dozen made it uh, maybe a week. And he said, uh, the one right before you made it to almost her fourth birthday. And then you. He did everything he could. Sacrificed everything he could for her. You should have died before you were six. But when you didn't, you continued to live. To thrive. He couldn't help but hope. I'll be honest, he sounds like a pretty good dad right here. He's like, look at you, you're a success. She's like, success, but not love. He's like, of course I love you. Now she's like, stop, you don't love me, you love your work. You told me stories of a mother. He's like, I made you happy. She's like, but it wasn't real. And he's like, real? Real, what the fuck is real? He's like, any idiot can knock their, knock somebody up. Any idiot can knock up their girlfriend. You're real because I made you. I had a much harder time making you than knocking up some random lady. Okay? You, I willed you into existence. Do you not understand the difference? Okay? You, you want to be, you could have been, you know, the daughter of some lady living in a trailer, you know, with six other kids. And she's like, yo, Corey, get me another beer. And he's like, I could have done that, but I didn't. I'm a fucking scientist and I put you in a Petri dish and I fucking grew you to my specifications. You're much better than you would have been if you had, you know, had, if he had to go trailer park hunting for a mama to his baby. Anyway, Corey's like, I hate you. I'm leaving, uh, and I'm walking out of here. And oh, by the way, I had the cure. Your your friend gave me the cure, and she he's he she takes her. She's going to walk away. She's running away from home. She takes off her shoes. She's like the grass feels nice. Anyway, uh, Doctor Soon comes running out to stop her, and she's like, "Oh yeah, here's here's the cure. It's in my hand. I I took it." 
And now Dr. Soon goes into psycho mode. He's like, you don't get to walk away from me. You don't exist without me. And Corey's like, if you follow me, I'll call the cops. Call them. What are they going to do? They're like, okay, ma'am, can I see some ID? What, officer? Yeah, can I see some ID? Oh, fuck. Yeah, he, but Dr. Soong stops and, and he just lets her walk off. She, he lets this woman who has never left the house walk off without fucking shoes. Without any fucking shoes. Where is she going to go? There's only, there's a very bad stuff is going to happen to Corey. Okay, so Rafi and Seven are walking around the fucking parking lot. And now they decide to fucking talk about their relationship. And Gerardi could have killed her. And they're like, oh, Gerardi didn't. The Borg Queen could have killed her. But Gerardi must have stopped it. Because Gerardi has, has, Gerardi has, has mercy. So Gerardi, Gerardi, Gerardi's still in there. But why are they in this parking lot? Uh, all this parking lot, uh, all, why is Gerardi stealing all these uh, car batteries? And she, Seven is like, she needs the metals and the car batteries to make nanoprobes. So she's like, how do we find out what she needs? And Rafi's like, oh, I stole the phone from that dead guy. I stole his fucking phone. Fuck you, dead guy. I didn't check for a pulse, but I took your phone. How and and she asks Seven, can we jump start? Can we jump start the cell phone with the tricorder? And you know what? She's got fucking jumper cables. How, who the fuck brings jumper cables for the tri for the fucking tripod? The first fucking time we see jumper cables attached to a tripod, where did they come from? Are they in your pocket the entire time? Anyway, Rafi is talking about how she's a manipulator, and we get the story about how, for no fucking reason, just in the middle of this, we decide to get the story of how Rafi manipulated Elnor to stay in Starfleet in the form of a flashback. So Elnor's in this scene, and he's saying about how he's going to go back to the Kawat Malo planet, Vishta or Vishta whatever the fuck it is, nobody remembers. It's from season one. Anyway, the Kawat Malo told Picard in no uncertain terms, we don't want him here. He has a dick. We don't deal with men. Take him, please. There's nothing for him here. That was what they said last season. But now they're like, Elnor's like, I've got to go back. I've got to fulfill my Kawat Malo no, you don't. You're not a co-op Malo. She said to, to Picard in no uncertain terms, he's not one of us. He never will be. He was just the best thing besides us. So Rafi guilts him into staying in Starfleet and then he dies. So Rafi is, feels bad that, you know, he ends up dying and she should because why the fuck are you even caring what Elnor does, are you just using him in place of your real son who wants nothing to do with you? Maybe you should be trying harder on your real son, Rafi. So he stayed for me, says Rafi. And then he died in her, her arms. Yeah, well, I guess you have a pretty shitty feeling. And Seven is like, ah, oh, Rafi. Let's go. Let's let's keep our. Uh, oh, the 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 phone just found. Oh, it just finished running a search history analysis. What? How does it even know to run a search history? She's like, what is he looking for? And and seven's like, for, for, she's looking for whatever she needs. And like they found out where she's going, and it's it's Doctor Soong's house. Oh my God, Doctor Soong is drinking at the bottom of the steps. And Gerardi comes in with her ripped up red dress. And he's looking. He's like, am I dreaming? Who is, or is this a nightmare? And he's talking to us. And he's picked up on the Corey thing. It must run in the family. We just talk out loud. 
even when there's nobody around to talk to. Anyway, he's like, is this a dream or a nightmare? And Gerardi says it could go either way. So now Picard is talking to the FBI agent alone, and the lights start flickering, and Guinan appears only to Picard. And it's hard because she has a nosebleed, but then the nosebleed goes away. Anyway, she's got the four Skype. She has the four Skype power now. Apparently, Elorians all have this power, but we only see it used for the first time now. Anyway, she's telling Picard that Q was just here to see her. And Picard says that the, the that stuck in the past is the is the clue. That being stuck in the past is the clue. How is that a clue? I have no fucking idea. But as soon as Picard hears that, he knows exactly what to tell the FBI agent. He's like, you've got something that's been chasing you your entire life. Uh, uh, let's agree to an exchange of truth. Tell me. Tell me, what, what am I to you, says Picard. Because obviously I'm something. This is all from Guinan flashing herself over. The lights flickered. The guy is like, I, I don't know what the hell's going on. He's like, you're the thing I've waited for my entire life to come to come to face with. You're the thing in the night. This is literally like Mulder's sister's story. Mulder's sister was abducted by gray aliens. Except for this guy, it's not his sister, but his dog, Maggie. Who the fuck names the dog Maggie? Oh, and he wasn't abducted by gray aliens, abducted by Vulcans. Well, really, the Vulcans didn't abduct the dog. I don't know. In fact, we never find out what happened to Maggie. The Vulcans were just working with equipment in the forest. Uh, it's like Carbon Creek, which is my favorite Enterprise episode. Uh, but it's not Carbon Creek because it's not those Vulcans. Uh, but clearly they're just setting up some listening equipment in the middle of the forest. And people, if you're ever in the forest in the middle of the night, and you've got a flashlight, and you see a light coming from over a ridge, and it's foggy, don't, for the love of God, don't go to the ridge. There's never anything good there. So this kid goes up the ridge, looks at the fog, puts his flashlight up, and there's a couple of neighborhood Vulcans setting up some random equipment next to a pond. So the kid runs away once he sees the Vulcans' faces. The Vulcans slowly walk to the top of the ridge with their own flashlights. And the kid has been running. He's tripping over shit. He's got to be two or three football fields away. And he picks up his flashlight, even though there's plenty of light in the scene. And the Vulcans are right there. How did they get right in front of him? God only knows. Anyway, the Vulcan male puts his face, his, you know, he, he's doing the, he's doing the, the mind melt. And the guy is misremembering how the mind melt went, but he's scared as fuck. Anyway, then the Vulcan gets beamed away in the middle of the mind melt. The problem is Vulcans from this period don't practice mind melt. They showed us this in Star Trek Enterprise. It was a forbidden taboo. Vulcans don't mind meld at this part of history because they're afraid of AIDS. Yes, if you watched Enterprise, if you watch Enterprise, you know that Vulcans considered mind melding a taboo thing because a undesirable small percentage of the population got got sick from mind melt. It was basically, they were teaching us about AIDS and homosexuality in 2005. Way, way late, but whatever. Uh, I, got, I got the message. Okay, but I also know this Vulcan would not dare mind meld with a human at this point in history. Okay, they should have, I don't know if they were going to take the kid, take the kid aboard the ship and try to erase his memory, but they would do anything but what they did and then leave him to be, just beam away. So Picard is telling him that wasn't an alien, that was a Vulcan. And he's like, and also, I'm a human, but you're not a human, you're a robot. 
and he says he's from Earth, but you're not from Earth. You're from whatever fucking planet rebuilt your body. And he's like, I'm here from the 25th century, 20, whatever the fuck, to save Earth. In fact, to save the whole galaxy. But he needs his help. And now we get that Star Trek music playing, dun, 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 dun. Like the Enterprise should be flying by, but there is no Enterprise because they wasted all their money and they can only do suit shoots in, you know, 2022 uh, basements and shit. So Rios is now at his ship, the transport is offline, and the kid's afraid he broke it. Rios says, no, you know, somebody else broke it. And then Rios says, let's go find your mom. But then uh, he sends the kid off without him. Where is the mother? Where's the mother on this spaceship? Where? How is she leaving her kid alone? She's leaving Rios alone. She's just, I don't know. What is she doing? Is she walking around Chateau Picard? Is she on the spaceship? Anyway, Rios has to call Rafi because he can't, he can't transport. So Guinan, fake Guinan and Picard are talking. Um, he says, you humans, Guinan saying, you humans do the work because you want to evolve. She forgot. She almost forgot how unique that was in the galaxy. And Picard is giving himself a pat on the back. He's like, yeah, we humans were pretty fucking special like that. He's like, do you have any idea what, what Picard, what Q was saying about uh, the escape as part of the answer? And she's like, I don't know. He seemed crazy. And so then Picard's like, well, do you know what time the mission is going off? The Europa mission? And Guinan's like, I'm not a fucking clock. So the, uh, the FBI agent's been fired. He's got his box of and everything. And he's going to give the fucking comm badge back to Picard. That's Rios's comm badge. Uh, Picard's like, well, what about the paperwork you filed? And he's like, I lied. I didn't file any paperwork. I want to be the one that proves alien life. I didn't tell anyone else you were here. You can just leave. Don't care. Ice won't care about the comm badge I took from their evidence. Nobody cares. So Guinan is like, oh... This is our species believes in an ebb and flow that our destinies come and, and leave and uh, they are what we make of it and that at some moments are meant to happen. And once again, even at great cost. So Guinan is just going through the spiel, which once again means nothing. So that like, yeah, so you were destined to be that boy so you could be this man to help you right now. He's like, I'll think it over. He's leaving. He's lost his job. He's lost everything. And he's just, he's like, you two should get moving. Another, another victim of the Picard. So his, another victim of the Picard timeline uh, change. Uh, Guinan's like, I didn't think I'd say this, but I, I'm almost going to miss you. So Gerardi is, is working on a computer and he's, uh, she's talking to Dr. Soong and she's like, I need faster satellites. Anyway, she's telling Soong that you're very famous where I come from. He's like, you, you get to leave a legacy. And Dr. Soong's like, no, they took everything. She's like, you'll get over it. He's like, you're currently at a fork in the ro road. You have two futures. One leads to you bring humanity back from the brink of extinction. They'll call you the father of the future. Statues will grace capitals. Or you die a drunk alone uh, in a pool of your own 90 proof vomit. So the guy gets up. He's like, well, how do I guarantee the other future? She's like, Rene Picard boards a spaceship and makes a discovery that, that makes your research obsolete or doesn't. If she doesn't, I've seen the results. Earth in your times time frame finds itself an ecological free fall. They're going to turn to you. You're going to save humanity. But if Rene Picard makes it to Europa, it's all off. So I guess Rene finds a special organism 
which can clean up all of our, our litter? Is that really the, the, is that really what they want us to, to, to go away with? That the whole reason humanity goes to peace and, and, and love is because Rene Picard in 2024 finds a, a organism that can cure our pollution woes. And we don't, we don't actually have to work hard at, at cleaning up our pollution. It's just going to come to us on IO or, or Europa or some shit. I guess that's what they're trying to tell us. Oh, so then Seven and Rafi walk into Guinan's bar where Picard is. And, and Rafi's like, what you doing, old man? Like, where the fuck have you been? And before Picard can even talk, she's like, you know what? Shut up, old man. We got to go. And poor... Anyway. Picard realizes that if they... If they... If she uh, jammed the transporter, the only thing they could be doing is going after the La Serena. So Picard's like, we've got to defend the ship. We've got to defend La Serena. Otherwise, the Borg Queen is going to have a 400 years uh, advance on, uh, on assimilating the galaxy. So, uh, they told us if, if Gerardi's coming, she's not coming alone. And two minutes later, two minutes later, Dr. Soon got off the phone with a general and there's two platoons of ex special forces in his fucking house. And they're the, two, the team of X special forces, complete with guns and all ready to go, talk to Gerardi and like, what do you want us to do? Gerardi, still in a torn up dress, walks up to the head guy, says, don't worry, it only stings for a moment. Everybody there watches her clearly stick nanoprobes into his face. They see his eyes go black, his face go green. And every single one of them stay there and is like, yes, please. How do I get mine? Thank you. Uh, I need, I need some, I need some of that nanoprobing. Nobody questions it. Nobody says, oh, maybe I'll, I'll sit this one out. Maybe, maybe I'll skip the nanoprobes. Uh, or maybe this mission I don't want to go on. Or maybe they just shoot. They're like, you know what? Stay the fuck away from me. No. And where? how did they get there? Where did they come from? Is he a disgraced guy or not? Because one minute he's the, the, the top of the ball. He can get anywhere and go anywhere and do anything. The next minute he's lost everything. He has nothing left to live for. It, it, it is. They have to figure out which one he is. They don't, of course, because they don't have to figure it out because you know what? We're watching it anyway. At least I am. Oh my God. It, it hurts my brain. This episode hurts my brain. Worse, I already did this review, but my computer didn't record it. And I'm so sorry because I, it was so much better. It was so much better. But alas, you have to deal with what I've got. The fucking tooth they pulled yesterday. I'm sure it's bleeding again. All I taste is blood. And it's better than the episode I watched. I don't even know how to score this. I don't even want to give it a score. Like, point one. Point 0.1 of 10, I guess. 0 0.1 out of 10. Kapla all. I hope I'm here next week. Episode 9. Bird out. <laughs>